This is Trep Wire Week in Review for the week ending February 9th, 2024. I'm Haley Keen with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS, commercial real estate, and CLO markets. I'm with Lonnie Hendry, Chief Product Officer, and Stephen Bushbaum, Research Director. This week, anyone outside of the commercial real estate space may have thought markets were improving. The S&P 500 broke the 5,000 mark on Thursday as corporate earnings have been generally positive. But one quick search reveals that mainstream media is now all over what we've been talking about for many months. The CRE sector continues to feel the pain of adjusting to higher rates, and losses from the office sector are far from over and are continuing to inflict pain on various institutions. So Stephen, are the CRE concerns overblown or is there something new that we should be paying attention to? You know, I I feel like this week was one of those, well, we have a lot of positivity in the markets. So, you know, where can we look for pain points and stress? And certainly the NYCB announcement last week of roughly $500 million in increases for loan loss reserves and the significant net charge-offs they took for office really just brought back the, the commercial real estate sector front and center to headlines. So I'm tempted to say this is this is somewhat of an overblown concern at the current point in time. However, it's really hard to ignore the fact that, you know, for Janet Yellen to be talking about commercial real estate and the likelihood of more pain is going to be felt throughout the banking sector, albeit maybe not causing a systematic event that would lead to a broader collapse. You know, that's that's certainly a good thing. But I think Janet Yellen put it very nicely that the pain is far from over and you're likely going to see some additional stress here in the market as these these adjustments continue to happen. Yeah, it's interesting, Stephen. You hear Janet Yellen kind of say that there's going to be some challenges, but they're not overly concerned and they don't think this is systemic. But is there really an option for her to say anything else? I'm like, doesn't she have to say that? And if you go back and like read some of the transcripts or some of her commentary, like 2007 and others, you know, that have been in similar positions in previous crisis, like no one's ever coming out and saying, oh my gosh, yeah, we think the banking sector's unstable. That doesn't <laughs> work, right? So I think it's interesting, like you have to listen to what they say and, you know, but you have to have some concern that there's just, they got to toe the line, right? I mean, like there's some reality to that. I know this week, the senior loan officer opinion survey came out. And if you look at that, just at a high level, basically says, hey, there's nothing to worry about. I think we're in good shape. Fewer respondents had said that there were tightening of lending standards for CRE loans. But you just dig a little bit deeper and you realize like, yeah, that's true, but it's because, you know, previous to that, we were at really high credit crunch type of levels. And so if you look at this outside of the most recent history and go back over the last five or 10 years, credit conditions are still really tight on a relative basis. And so, you know, construction loans, land development, still major concern. And so it'll be interesting to see, like, you just have this really weird dichotomy in the market right now where I I had an event today that I was at in person. There's a lot of developers, a lot of owners, a lot of operators, and, you know, they're mostly Texas based. And the reality was they were like, man, our market is on fire. Even office stuff was like outside of Dallas CBD, there's a ton of new activity going on. You read these investor surveys or senior loan office surveys, and it's somewhat positive, but then you see the stuff with uh, New York Community Bank and it's like, all of this is all in the same ecosystem, just depending on where your perspective is or where your, you know, maybe your your money is, you know, as an owner operator or looking for debt. It's really interesting to see how your perspective can be changed by those factors. Yeah. And at this point, it, it changes. It, it almost feels like week to week and definitely month to month as additional news breaks and we get some optimism about rate cuts or that gets, you know, taken away and we're left in this uncertain limbo. And so going back to the the comments from Janet Yellen, you know, I 100% right about towing the line. The way I think about the commentary from senior officials like that is if you go back through and read, and this is a, a really fun exercise, at least for, you know, Fed watching geeks like me, is you go back and read the Fed commentary leading up to the 08 collapse of AIG and Lehman Brothers. And you had like that ostrich effect of, Okay, we're going to toe the line, toe the line. You know, there's definitely some concerns. And then once you start getting closer to the major trigger event, um, you definitely started to, you know, you could almost feel the sweat <laughs> dripping down their forehead as they were making those, those those comments. And so, you know, it's reassuring that we don't have those beads of sweat emanating from, you know, their, their comments on paper. 
But that being said, you know, this is certainly how it starts if you do hit a systematic event. So yeah, it's just a precarious mix right now. It's really interesting. If we look at New York Community Bank, there were some headlines that came out today that said they're, you know, trying to offload their mortgage risk. They plan to sell RV loans. Little did we know they were evidently having a overexposure to some RV loans. But what's interesting, the takeaway from here was that they were, you know, trying to create a synthetic risk transfer backed by a portfolio of about $5 billion worth of home loans uh, that were originated with interest rates were lower. So for everything that we just got through saying, when I hear people talking about deleveraging their risk using synthetic instruments, it doesn't exude a ton of confidence, right? And I think that's the reality there. You know, these synthetic securitizations effectively allow them to offload their exposure by transferring the risk of the assets to the buyer. It's an interesting concept. Maybe they'll be successful at this. They just had their rating cut to junk status. And so look, there's an interesting dynamic in the market right now. I think we're going to have plenty to talk about for the next several weeks, just given the ebbs and flows of all of the, the items we just outlined in the intro today. Yeah, and to your point, Lonnie, about synthetic risk transfer, if you step back from this and just think, okay, as an institution, if I'm trying to get risk off of my books and I, I'm perfectly liquid, I'm just trying to better position myself, I'll probably just pick and choose what loans I'm going to sell outright. And so to be talking about you know, using an instrument that's kind of splitting the difference between selling loans wholesale and having to book that loss or holding them and, you know, not being too happy about it, that, that definitely tells me that while this is probably, I shouldn't say probably, it is the best option for where we're at right now, but it, it speaks to just how much um, liquidity crunch you have on, on certain balance sheets. And this week, we also were looking at the CMBS universe and the loan losses specifically, and we actually saw the loan loss volume increase in January 2024. Yes. Yeah, so we had in January, $834 million of losses across 18 loans that resolved with actually a little bit over $400 million in losses total, carrying a loss severity of roughly 50%. So I should point out that a large portion of this 834 million was driven by the approximately $450 million Veritas loan that was liquidated after a Brookfield Venture bought the note at roughly 89 cents on the dollar. And that booked a loss of roughly 50%. So what was interesting about that liquidation in particular was that there was a massive holdback. Um, so if you had been reading the remit reports leading up to that, there was cumulative unpaid but advanced principal and interest and other fees that totaled $30 million in the month prior. However, there was $195 million loss booked on that loan. And so we're still going to be waiting here for another month or two or even more uh, for some of this reconciliation to come through. So if we look back over the last couple of months, we'd had relatively low liquidation volumes. In November and December, there was about 79 million that was liquidated in November, 174 million in December. So even absent the Veritas liquidation that was driving that overall disposed loan amount number, liquidations did pick up significantly. And I think this speaks to the, the transaction volume that we saw in December and into January overall. And so with rates coming down, you saw a willingness of buyers to step in for servicers to, to liquidate those loans and what they perceived as being better market conditions. Yeah, so Haley and Steven, I saw this uh, headline this week and I wanted to, to raise it on the pod today because I think it's it's interesting considering when we had Danielle DiMartino Booth on last week and we were talking extensively about the layoffs that took place and sizable layoffs across a number of notable companies um, in January. And as Steven mentioned, you know, we have all this CRE distress that's being played out in the mainstream media. But kind of to your point, Haley, if you're outside of the CRE universe, it appears that people feel like the market is generally pretty strong. This headline was CEO confidence rises to the highest level in two years. This is from Axios. Um, so it says the first time in two years, CEOs are optimistic about the economy. Consumer confidence hit a two-year high in January. Improvements are, have much to do with booming stock market, declining inflation. And they're saying low unemployment, which is true, even in spite of the layoffs. Um, so it'll be really interesting to see, like, with the re-election year, with all these other things that are upcoming, does that maybe sway some of these uh, CEOs' perspective? I'm wondering if this survey was done in December when Powell made his comments and everyone thinks, oh, we're heading into January of the new year on an uptick, 
Um, and if you surveyed them now, they might have a different perspective. Um, but I think just given all of the items that we talked about today, it's kind of interesting to see the CEO survey reporting uh, such an optimistic outlook for this year. You know, and one other thing that I question if it's it's driving this optimism, at least to some extent, is last year we had one of the highest rates of CEO turnover in recent years. So is some of this, you know, the optimism of the the new person in the hot seat, you know, trying to to whip up investor confidence and boost stock prices? I mean, hard to tell, but you know, I, I do question that a little bit. Yeah. So while we're not confident about CEOs having so much confidence in the economy and what's to come. And we are talking about negatives in CRE. We did see a few bright spots this week, and that's in a segment that a lot of you are always asking us to cover, which is the industrial segment. Yeah, so this week we're kicking off the property sector with the industrial market. I think this is a first in podcast history, so maybe mark it down for all of you industrial lovers out there. And we're uh, going out to sunny San Diego for our first story, which we'll be at uh, this week for the NBA conference starting on Sunday. So flying out to San Diego on Sunday, Love to see you guys there. If you're going to be there, reach out. We'll get something set up. Uh, but back to the story, Sorrento View Business Park, which is a seven-building industrial property, about 140,000 square feet in San Diego, was recently sold for $45 million. This is one of those stories, Stephen, where it's industrial transaction at $323 a square foot. My brain still has a hard time comprehending that. But at this point, we have enough of those sales to where I know that's what the market is. And so this property was actually sold by the current owner from Lake Forest, California, which is Sorrento 7 LLC, and it was sold to an undisclosed investor. Uh, Colliers arranged the deal. The property was built in 1988, had addresses that ranged 5945 to 5965 Pacific Center Boulevard, 10151 to 10211 Pacific Mesa Boulevard and 5940 Pacific Mesa Court. The buildings had 14 to 16 foot clear heights and 43 ground level doors and office space. So an interesting, nice story to kick off the industrial segment. We had one that uh, sold in, this is a development site for industrial in Vancouver, Washington, which sold for 96 million. Killian Pacific paid 96 million. This is for a 113 acre development site within the Columbia Business Center. Um, a 2 million square foot industrial property in Vancouver, Washington. This is according to commercial property executive. The Portland, Oregon developer bought the land. Uh, this was a deal through a private family office uh, that was represented by Newmark and Colliers. Uh, Columbia Business Center was built in the 1940s um, at 705 Southeast Victory Avenue. This is along Washington's border with Oregon and 10 miles north of Portland, just to give you some geographical reference has 27 buildings, which were not part of the sale, as well as 1,800 parking spaces. In that particular center, there's over 100 tenants um, at the property. Then we have Caprock purchased an industrial property again up in Washington for $34 million. I think it's interesting. We've talked at, at length about Washington State in particular having some challenges due to the office downsizing, so Microsoft, Amazon, et cetera. But their industrial sector seems to be doing really, really well, and these sales support that. So uh, Caprock Partners uh, purchased the property for $214 a square foot, 160,000 square foot reserve at Woodenville Industrial Property. This is actually located in Woodenville, Washington, 20 miles north of Seattle. Newport Beach, California investment manager bought the property, which is six years old at 15902 Woodenville Redmond Road from an affiliate of Aries Management. And the deal was arranged by JLL. This $34 million purchase was funded with a $25 million loan. And this particular property is 100% occupied and has 30-foot clear heights. And then lastly, rounding up here in Washington area, we have Seattle Industrial Property that sold for $41 million. Uh, Walter East Nelson Company uh, paid $41 million or $223 a square foot for the Cascade Building. 184,000 square foot industrial property in Bonnie Lake, Washington. The Portland, Oregon company purchased the property at 9713 233rd Avenue, 40 miles from Seattle. Um, they purchased it from Cascade RCL LLC, uh, which was represented by Kidder Matthews. Um, Walter East Nelson, the buyer, structured the purchase as part of a 1031 exchange. And the company which is a distributor of janitorial supplies will eventually occupy the building. So in this case, 
they purchased a property for their own use. Right now, Cascade RCL, which was the seller, uh, which is a real estate company, will remain as a tenant. So another great story um, in, in Washington. So Lonnie, as you're going through those stories, I, I'm going to show my age here, but when you're reading off the dollar per square foot here, I'm thinking, gosh, when I was underwriting this stuff, it was $40, $60 a square foot price. And if we hit 80, heaven forbid, $100 a square foot, you know, you you got some raised eyebrows and thought this stuff was rich. So this this continues to amaze me how far we've come with industrial valuations and the strength that you know this this market just shows very few signs of you know slowing. It's really remarkable, and we've seen it across the U.S. So it's not like it's just concentrated in the California markets or it's concentrated in in markets that maybe have access to a port or something else where there's an external driver. Uh, we're seeing these types of prices across the U.S. I mean, we've had several in Arizona, California, Florida, et cetera. It's just kind of like the 3% cap rate on multifamily. Like my brain still has a hard time computing that. And so we'll see how long this can last. I mean, the first story we talked about that had our 14 to 16 foot clear heights, to your point, that's like a $45 a square foot building in my in my brain, sold for 322 bucks. And it's it's not like it's 500,000 square feet, it's 140,000 square feet. I mean, it's just, there's gotta be something to that. I don't know what the lease structure was on that or who the tenant was or what the term was, or I don't have that level of detail on this particular story, but I'm with you, two to 300 bucks has become the norm. And it's a, it's, it's a new day for industrial and I'm glad that we made this a primary focus for our uh, property segment this week. I agree. We need some bright spots here in commercial real estate. So now we'll turn to a segment that is not shy of headlines and gets a lot of coverage from us, but we have even more coverage this week. And we wanted to start quickly by running through the last piece of our one of our series of reports, which was on office property expenses. And this week, our teams released a series that looked at repair and maintenance costs for office CRE properties across the U.S. Stephen, can you break down what some of the findings were? Sure. So across the 50 largest U.S. markets by population size, repairs and maintenance costs increased 12.3% from 2021 to 2022. So the market that topped the list for the highest increase, year-over-year -year increase in repairs and maintenance cost was the Orlando market, posting a 35% increase year-over-year. -year. Um, and some coastal markets bringing up the next few spots. But I will say we, we had some very interesting findings. So please reach out to us at podcast at trep.com. If you want to get a copy of this report, we'll be more than happy to, to send it to you. Yeah, this has been a great series for us. We've gone through and looked at property taxes, insurance, repairs, and maintenance, just like we do with the multifamily. I think some of the MSAs that had exposure to some of these, you know, really high increases might be surprising when you look at it. So again, like Orlando office wouldn't jump off the, the page to me before the analysis is probably having the highest, you know, increased cost. But as the report shows, it, it does. And so I think there's some interesting takeaways in that level of research that we put out. And we also had a bunch of office stories touching the CMBS markets and across the CRE market this week. So up first, we have a major new lease for the gas company tower in LA. After falling apart last year, it looks like the city of Los Angeles is set to execute a roughly 300,000 square foot lease at gas company tower or GCT, according to Commercial Observer. The lease has been in the works for some time and it was reported as dead in October of 2023. However, the lease has found new life and it looks like we will have five LA city departments that will be relocating to GCT relatively soon. This is a $350 million loan that backs a 2021 CMBS deal. The collateral is nearly 1.4 million square feet at 555 West 5th Street and a garage at 350 South Figueroa Street. The new city lease would be at a, uh, it's a 15 year term for 310,000 square feet with a First year base rent of $48 per square foot with 3% annual rent increases starting in December of 2024. Moving expenses and TIs were reported at $210 per square foot 
or approximately 55 million, with the owner providing 34 million and the city picking up the remainder. The landlord is helping offset the upfront TIs with future rent abatements, totaling approximately 19 million. So while the city is picking up the tab there, there is an offset with rent abatements. The new lease with the city of Los Angeles will help offset the loss of the second largest tenant, Sidley Austin, who leases roughly 10% of the building, almost 137,000 square feet, and signaled earlier last year that they would be vacating upon their lease expiration in October 2026. This loan was slated to mature in March, although extension options could have pushed the maturity to 2026. The loan wasn't extended after Brookfield announced that they would not be exercising their extension option on a pair of Los Angeles office loans and a receiver was appointed. So the lease is certainly good news, but when you start digging into the details here, a lot had to be given away to execute this. And I think this is consistent with what we've seen in the office space with uh, the high TIs being offset with a longer term to try and recoup that on the back end of the lease. Yeah, it's like, hey, look at this awesome lease that we signed, 15-year term, high rental rate. Don't look at anything else. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. Up next, we have a Virginia office loan moves to REO. According to January remit data, the $50.4 million Dallas View loan is now REO. A for foreclosure sale was completed on December 19th, 2023, and the trust was a successful bidder. In addition, the appraised value was lower to $50 million, according to the May 2023 appraisal that was reported in January 2024 data, pushing the LTV to approximately 120%. This loan matured in April 2023, but the borrower was unable to refinance and would not agree to contribute new capital to secure a loan extension. This loan makes up just under 16% of the collateral behind a 2013 deal. The Dulles View property is 360,000 square foot in Herdon, Virginia. At securitization, the top five tenants behind the loan had lease expirations between 2019 and 2021. None of those appear to be the top tenants according to the latest servicer data. And these departures helped push occupancy to as low as 48% in 2018. The debt service coverage ratio has been under 1.0 in 2019 through 2021. Since then, the property has rebounded considerably. In 2022, the debt service coverage ratio based on net cash flow was reported at 1.35 times when occupancy was 80%. Yeah, this is an interesting story, Stephen. You have you know debt service coverage at 135 at 80% occupancy and loan to value still at 120%. Like it just not a great story here, but it, it showcases the lender doesn't want this one back either. And so it'll be interesting to see that the borrowers effectively stated they don't have the capital to put into the deal to refi. And so this will be one we keep an eye on here and update you as the, uh, the commentary gets updated real time. So up next, we have WeWork rejects a lease in Manhattan's Chelsea neighborhood. WeWork continues to trim its footprint and announced a fresh set of lease rejections on Wednesday, according to BizNow. One of these leases that WeWork listed on its newest rejection list is the 214 to 224 West 29th Street property. WeWork accounts for just over 50% of leased space and two thirds of the underwritten rent on a lease that was set to end in 2034. The subject property backs the 74 million 214 to 224 West 29th Street loan, which makes up roughly 6.5% of the collateral behind a 2019 deal. The collateral is a 200,000 square foot office in Manhattan's Chelsea neighborhood, a few blocks south of Madison Square Garden and Penn Station. The property was valued at 160 million at securitization, giving the loan an LTV of 46% at the time. For 2022, the loan posted a debt service coverage ratio of 1.11 times when occupancy was 65%. So this is some very detrimental news to the property to be losing the main cash flow contributor. Yeah, 65% was inclusive of the WeWork lease at that point. And so uh, this is just going to get below 1.0 debt service very quickly. And it just goes, it goes to show like... When something looks too good to be true, it usually is. So when we work with signing 20 and 30 year leases on the front end of these things, you know, that's just not how the market operates. And now, unfortunately, I know it's kind of been out of the spotlight for a couple of months, but we've talked about this so many times. The WeWork stuff that people were nervous of at the front end of these securitizations are really just continuing to provide challenges for these office owners and operators that have to deal with them rejecting leases at this point, not paying, et cetera, et cetera. So this is, this is just a pretty good example of how that tenant is going to take a, a property that's struggling and really put it underwater. 
And just as a, a little bit of an aside here to give some off the run color for from a boots on the ground perspective, I was talking to a friend here this past weekend whose company currently is leasing some WeWork space in Washington, D.C. And this is one of those cases where WeWork was going to reject the lease and the tenant got a notice to vacate the property. However, they wanted to stay in this Washington, D.C. building. So they went to the landlord to try and sign a direct lease. But the landlord basically was basically told the tenant, look, I, I don't want to do anything right now because, well, we works in bankruptcy and there's likely to be, I think the landlord is hoping that there might be some remuneration for at least termination or possibly some other things associated with WeWork's prior occupancy at the property. And so even in cases where the tenants that are subleasing through WeWork effectively want to stay in the building, the fact that you have you know basically a stalemate in some cases is uh, really unfortunate. Yeah, it's, it just shows some of the challenges of that business model, right? So the business, the property owner effectively has no business relationship with those tenants. I mean, for legal reasons, they can't really pursue that right now, pending, you know, the outcome of the bankruptcy and potential litigation. So yeah, to your, to your friend, that's, they're now in a real quandary, right? Because they probably still effectively have a lease with WeWork and, you know, they're going to have to go try to find some other office space. I mean, this, that's what I'm saying. It gets, it gets very messy very quickly. And, Unfortunately, this is not a one or two type of building challenge. This is all across the U.S. where we work as exposure. And we've done a lot of research. We have a lot of that data available. If you're just now getting interested in CRE and you don't know about the WeWork saga, we definitely have some stuff we can send you if you would like. Just uh, email us at podcast at trep.com. So to wrap up our office segments, we have the purchase of a stake in an LA office building results in a 9% cap rate. Boston Properties has acquired the 45% stake in the Santa Monica Business Park held by the Canadian Pension Plan Investment Board, giving its full ownership of the 1.12 million square foot office complex in Santa Monica, California. The deal places a $395 per square foot or $467.13 million value on the property, which results in a 9% going in cap rate. But that includes ownership on a fee simple basis meaning including the land beneath the property, which is separately owned. The property, meanwhile, is 88% leased. The Boston REIT paid CPPIB $38 million for its stake and assumed $20 million of working capital. Boston Properties and CPPIB, which administers Canada's national retirement system, had purchased the 21-building Santa Monica Business Park in 2018 for $616 million. The deal was funded in part with the $300 million loan from a group of banks led by J.P. Morgan Chase, paid a coupon pegged to LIBOR plus 128 basis points. But the venture had fixed its rate at 4.063% through an interest rate swap. So we might have to do like a uh, educational segment on uh, on that one at some point in the near future. Because I know if, if you're a new listener to the podcast or you're not from uh, this space, a lot of those terms might have been a little bit over your head. So We'll, we'll make a note of this one, Haley, maybe, and come back to this in a week or two. And we can have myself or Stephen kind of walk through some of the nuance here with the, the way this loan was was structured and the, what the interest rate swap means and how that potentially had had an impact on, on this deal. But look, a 9% uh, cap rate on an LA office in today's market, uh, I would have to say that's not just silver lining. That's kind of over the moon good news. Yeah, we can definitely do an educational segment, Lonnie, and send us your questions. If you're listening to this and something we're talking about sparks a question about something else, send it our way. We'll make sure we'll work it into upcoming segments or tie it back to any stories that we're tracking. So let's move on. We do have more office stories, but I want to cover some more property types today. So let's turn to retail. We had a few stories this week about mall loans and different retail centers across the country. Yeah, so um, if you want to see more of those office stories, you can subscribe to our daily newsletter called The Rundown, where we actually provide sales transaction, lease transaction stories every day and keep you up to date on what's taking place in the CRE market. Just uh, email us at podcast at trep.com. We'll get you the link to sign up for that. And as you mentioned, Haley, some, some retail stories here. I would say these are somewhere in between the super optimistic industrial stuff that we had at the front end of the pod and maybe some of the negative stuff on the office. Although we're going to start off here with the Connecticut retail loan that saw the uh, the value reduced. So January remittance data show that the value behind a $21 million Newington Commons loan has been cut considerably. 
Uh, this loan is uh, one that's been with the special servicer since May of 2022. So this isn't shocking news. It's 189,000 square foot community shopping center in Newington, Connecticut. At securitization, the property was appraised for 32.3 million. Unfortunately, this month, the value was lowered to 21.2 million. So I know we've had a lot of uh, good stories on the community shopping center front over the last couple of months where sales prices coming in and us seeing you know, value appreciation. This is one of those negative ones where we've seen a pretty significant decline in value. If you look back at the first nine months of 2023, this property posted debt service coverage at net cash flow at just 0.63x when occupancy was 84%. So this one is in trouble, probably even at the new value of 21 million. Uh, an Illinois mall, this is one that gets an $8 million infusion. North Riverside Park Mall is slated to get an $8 million infusion from the FEEL organization for renovations. This is a, according to a story in The Real Deal. This is a 430,000 square foot mall. This property contains 430,000 square foot of retail space and a 1.1 million square foot regional mall in North Riverside, Illinois. Um, the loan was modified in 2021. This is one of those that we saw a bifurcation where you had a senior note and a B note. Um, this property had an appraisal at 129 million back in 2014, which unfortunately was lowered to 48.8 million in 2019, and then ultimately lowered to 33 million in late 2020. So at this point, the A note is significantly higher than the most recent valuation. And in addition to creating the B note, which we talked about a moment ago, the maturity date was also pushed out five years. This loan was slated to mature in 2019. Uh, here we are bumping up against that maturity date now. This is one of those properties that lost the Sears anchor back in 2020, even though Sears was not part of the collateral for the loan, still negatively impacts the overarching uh, mall collateral space. Um, if you look at this one for the first nine months of 2023, loan posted the DSCR at net cash flow at 2.21x with occupancy at 87%. What are your thoughts on this one, Stephen, with an $8 million infusion? Does that make a dent here? It's it's hard to say. So I was just up at a mall in Connecticut a couple of weeks, like weekends ago, and, and you know I was really chewing on this question of what do you do with malls that have lost like a Sears anchor? They've lost a bunch of inline tenants. And in general, this, the foot traffic is dramatically down. And this particular mall I was at, I'll tell you the busiest places in this mall were the pickleball courts and the indoor children's playground. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's wild that, you know, the, we talk about adaptive reuse. I mean, it's, it's certainly a creative use, but there's only so much gym, pickleball, or, you know, other type social space that can backfill that much area. So to me, I look at this one and I think it's ultimately possibly becoming a land play at, at some point, but who knows? Maybe, uh, maybe pickleball can be the answer to some of its flows. So you must have been at the mall in Stamford, if I'm guessing. Um, I think they converted. It was either a Neiman Marcus or some other big box retailer to a pickleball court. And they actually sell memberships and uh, try to turn it into a recurring revenue model. It'll be interesting to see how that uh, how long that lasts and what, what the viability of that is going on the on the go forward. But I do think for now, it is interesting when you walk into a mall and you have pickleball. You know, Maybe they'll have to get some healthier food options in the food court, though, for people there. So I think that about wraps up our retail section. We do have some multifamily stories that we'll go through quickly. And then I believe we have one lodging story to close. Yeah, so I love talking about multifamily stories. There's been a lot of negative headlines um, recently, but there's still some good good news in the market for multifamily. Heinz pays $117.5 million for San Jose, California apartment complex. So we mentioned there's still some good transaction uh, data in the marketplace. Heinz uh, Global Income Trust purchased the property for $472,000 per unit. It's a 249-unit Hanover Diridon apartment complex in San Jose, California. The Heinz Global Income Trust, which is a Houston REIT, whose shares do not trade on any exchange, bought the property from the Hanover Company, which is also based in Houston. Uh, the property is at 715 West Julian Street. It's 95% leased and has been renamed Diridon West. Its units have up to two bedrooms, each that are outfitted with quartz countertops and kitchen backsplashes, Italian cabinetry with soft closed hardware, um, double vanities, and walk-in closets. So nice story coming out of San Jose on the multifamily side. 
And unfortunately, to kind of circle to some some you know somewhat negative multifamily news, a Carlisle Adventure uh, purchased the Air Apartments in Manhattan for two hundred and sixty five million. Um, this was a venture between Carlisle Group and Gotham Organization. They paid eight hundred sixty one thousand a unit for the three hundred and ten unit Air Apartments, which is in the Lincoln Square section of Manhattan. This story comes from the New York Post. Uh, the sale uh, by a and r Calumon Realty allows for the payoff of the $218 million worth of debt against the property. Um, the financing, however, had defaulted at its maturity last November. There was $193 million senior CMBS loan split across a couple of deals. The implied LTV for the, the $218 million whole loan, based on the sales price at $265 million, is 82%. We highlighted this loan back in June of 23. Uh, when the loan was spent to, sent to special servicing ahead of its November 23 maturity. And again, in January 24, when Crane's New York business reported that they were looking to sell the property, uh, a and Calumon Realty. Uh, much of the property's woes come from the expiration of the 421A tax abatement that had lowered the property tax bill on this property to $1.1 million. However, with that expiration, the property now pays $6.6 .6 in property taxes annually, so for those of you in the Manhattan market, you know this was a hot button issue uh, for the last several months. When that tax abatement uh, went away, this is the real impact of, of that in, in real time, about a $5 million delta on the taxes. Occupancy for this property was strong. It was 97% back in 2018, had dropped to 70% in 2020. However, uh, most recent reporting shows occupancy back to 97%, but the DSCR continues to lag. In fact, DSCR has been less than one since 2017. Um, if you look at the first nine months of 2023, DSCR for this property was just 0.86x. So I would say maybe this is a mixed green, Stephen. Uh, They're actually able to get out from under the loan, sell it for more than the, the loan balance. But relative for, to what this property was supposed to be and what the prospects looked like with the tax abatement and the cash flow was generating, I would say the the previous owners of this have to be disappointed. Yeah, I would agree there. This is this is a mixed green. It was kind of a necessary adjustment that had to flow through once that tax abatement burned off and things weren't quite as as positive as you know everyone had hoped they would be. But to your point, the the fact that this transacted it seems like uh, occupancy has improved and leasing has, has gained some traction. You know, it's not, it's not all bad news, even though at face value, it looks like a negative headline. So agree, mixed green. And let's close with the R story on the hotel segment. Sure. So this final one we have is Hall Structured leads a $67.1 million loan for Northern California Hotel. Hall Structured Finance and Nuveen Green Capital have provided a total of $67.1 million of financing for the construction of a 215-room Marriott Courtyard residence in at 800 Morgan's Way in Sandy City, California, near Monterey in Northern California. Hall of Dallas provided a $39 million mortgage, while Nuveen provided $28.1 million of Commercial Property Assessed Clean Energy, or CPACE, financing. JLL Capital Markets arranged the financing for the property's owner, a venture of EKN Development Group of Newport Beach, California and Garn Development of Garn, Utah. The hotel is slated for completion in the fall of 2025. So this is this is great to see. I was at a conference with Alexander Cooley, who is the CEO of Nuveen Green Capital, and she was telling me their their loan book grew, uh, I think it was in excess of 200% year over year in 2023. So while mortgage capital flows were very muted in 2023. That is an absolute bright spot in the market. I think this speaks to just the flexibility of CPACE financing that many people see this as a funding to fill a gap or plug a gap in the capital structure if maybe you're looking to do some CapEx. But um, this this financing, the CPACE financing can also be used for new construction. And as you can see here, it's accounting for a very good chunk of the capital stack. Yeah, I want to give a shout out to the folks at Hall Structured Finance. So, Stephen, you and I have had several of our former students at Texas Tech actually go to work there. They're based here in a suburb of Dallas, and it's really great to see them still making deals and being active in the market um, given today's uh, challenges. For our programming notes this week, we have an upcoming webinar this time. It's on the banking market. So you've heard us talking about our coverage of New York Community Bancorp and all of what's transpired there. 
but our banking team will be diving into some of the data that we have. So a lot of people may not realize this, but along with CMBS and CRE data sets, we also collect data from large and mid-sized banks. So we'll be diving into some of our takeaways there. We'll talk about credit allowance trends and look at CRE and CNI construction portfolios on this webinar. So if you're interested, it's on Monday, February 12th at 1 p.m. Eastern, and you can send an email to podcast at trip.com. For our other programming notes, TREP has several open roles across our departments. So you can always find those on our website and our LinkedIn page. But I know you wanted to highlight one of them specifically today, Lonnie. Yeah, so I'm a little bit uh, biased here because this is uh, someone that would be joining mine and Steven's team. We're looking for a senior commercial real estate and uh, CMBS researcher. So we're, we posted a job on our website. You can apply directly on our website, submit a resume, and go through the process. We're going to be scheduling interviews for this role um, very quickly. This is something we want to get filled as, as quickly as possible. We're looking for someone that has five to seven years in commercial real estate research, uh, has the ability and, and has some demonstrated capabilities of producing commentary, content, understanding CMBS, underwriting, along with the general understanding of risk metrics. So we have a full job description posted on the website. Uh, this is someone that would be working directly with our product sales and technology teams. We'll be working very closely with Steven and myself on a daily basis. So if uh, you enjoy the podcast, if you enjoy kind of our banter back and forth um, and you think you'd be a good fit for this role, uh, you have some demonstrated uh, capabilities and competencies. Uh, we'd love to see a resume and an application from you. Um, and so, you know, send us what you got. We'll be happy to talk through it. We have another job. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a two for one here, Haley. We have a lending specialist job that's posted as well. Uh, that would be part of our lending um, team and similar job posted on the website, five to seven years experience um, with a, an understanding of the banking industry, risk management, underwriting in the CRE space. I won't read the full description of this as well, but check it out online. We have a couple of really nice roles. Uh, join a really great team, be part of a dynamic company. Um, if it's of interest to you, please reach out to us. We'll be happy to uh, to get your resume in the queue. Thank you. And Haley, I know you're going to do some shout outs here in a minute, but uh, as we were recording the podcast today, I saw that you and I were both active on Twitter and we had one of our listeners, uh, Jason Chaliff, had, had tweeted us and asked if we could do a shout out for his partner, Michael Godin of Denali. And so we're going to do that, Jason. We just gave him a shout out. We appreciate you listening. Thanks for sharing the podcast. And uh, maybe we'll get you guys some swag sent out too. It's perfect timing. If you message us right around the sweet spot of Thursday afternoon, Eastern time, you could get your shout out live on the podcast. So that worked <laughs> out for them. Okay. And turning to shout outs, this might be our most shout outs ever because we had a guest podcast last week, so we didn't get to run through them. And we've been giving you guys a lot to reach out to us about. We had so many of you request access to our daily newsletter or our Market Pulse webinar, or our Office Property Expense Series. So thank you to all of you who reached out about those items. And you should have heard from my colleague Ennis or myself. If not, ping us again, and we'll be sure to get back to you this week. But for a few others, we had a bunch of people reach out and send us some of their thoughts. So I'll run through those quickly. Warren D. said last week's episode was the best show yet in his two years as a listener. There's a team... Brett B, Brian L, and Nick E, who are big fans of the pod. I know they talked with our colleague Jen, and we're going to chat with them again soon. So thank you to your team. Andy B said episode 241 was just awesome. Fun interview to listen to. Riley N is excited about the newsletter, and he would love to hear more stores, stories from the team. Luke V is a longtime listener and a first-time caller and is thanking us for the podcast. A bunch of people on Twitter Gave us shout outs for last week's episode. Gamage V, Izzy, Micah L, Gracie K, Adam K. Chris W said he loves the podcast and recently became a listener, but has he been using TREP since 08? So we're going to have to tell your account manager about that. That's awesome to hear. Fred K thanked us and really enjoys the podcast. Jeff H is a huge fan and is a weekly listener. Peter D. has been a longtime listener of the podcast and looks forward to listening on his Friday commutes. Alex C. appreciates the podcast and all the work that the team does, so thank you for that. 
Michael D. loves the podcast. Kevin A. is a regular listener. Miraj A. thanked us for another great podcast. Troy S. said, thanks for the podcast because my dog gets longer walks on Friday morning. So we're glad to hear that. Eric V. was reaching out because he frequently listens to the podcast and was interested in some of our content. Brian C. is an avid listener and loves the show. He wanted some of our multifamily reports. Scott C. met with Stephen and our colleague Jen and said he listens every morning while on his runs. Will B. recently discovered the podcast and is excited that he found it. Cole R. loves the podcast and has been listening since April 2023 when we were live in Detroit, so that's pretty cool to hear. Thank you, Cole, for reaching back out to us. Bart Van L. said he's really enjoying the podcast and the great insights into the CRE space. Jared S. let our colleague Nicole know that he loves the podcast and listens every week. And Joe A. said, you guys are great. Thanks for the podcast. So there's a bunch more of you, but please reach out to us if we're owing you something or you had a question or a comment or an idea for another topic we should talk about. And I know, Lonnie, you've been hearing a lot from your friend, Iman J. He introduced us to a bunch of people, but he also sent us over one of their recent deals that we wanted to shout out quickly so Iman Jay and his team recently sold the Light Road Apartments, which is a 168-unit Class B 70s garden-style complex in Illinois, located about 45 minutes outside of Chicago. They bought the property in March 2020 for $14.1 million and sold it for $22 million to a local buyer. So congrats on that deal, Iman. And if anyone has other deals or anything that they're working on, you think we might be interested in, you can feel free to send it our way. And before we close, I know it's a big weekend for a lot of people, and you may think we're talking about the Super Bowl, but we're actually talking about the Mortgage Bankers Association Conference that the TREP team will be flying out to this weekend, and they will be watching and celebrating the Super Bowl there. So, Lonnie, I know you'll be there, along with a bunch of other people from the TREP team. So if you're going to be attending... Make sure to stop by our booth. We'll be at booth 409. Lonnie will be on an Office Trends panel. And you can come by, meet the team, get some swag. Yeah, we'll also have the ability to demo the products and talk through some of our other services with you as well. So if you're in town, um, even if you're not actually attending the conference, uh, shoot us an email, uh, give us a call. Happy to come downstairs and meet with somebody, even if you can't get into the uh, the exhibitor space. But looking forward to a uh, you know, MBA is always an interesting and exciting conference, Haley, because it's really a it's a deal makers conference, and so the the roar of the the crowd is there all day, every day of the conference, and it's always a fun time to uh, to be there. So we're looking forward to it. Would love to meet with uh, some of our listeners and see if there's anything we can do to help each other. And it's a good time to give a shout out now to another Treppy, Alan D, who manages our Super Bowl boxes at the Trep office. He manages a lot of other things along with our CMBS product line. But so that's kind of how I'll be rooting based off what my Super Bowl box tells me to do. But I'm sure you guys have other opinions on who you're rooting for this weekend. So on the Super Bowl, it's the same day as the start of the NBA conference. Like I'm from Texas, Central uh, Central Time Zone, fly out to San Diego, Pacific Time. Feels like the Super Bowl starting like in the middle of the afternoon. It's just so awkward. So like for the last three years, I haven't even really watched the Super Bowl. So I'm actually rooting for the Chiefs, um, but I doubt that I actually partake in watching uh, watching the Super Bowl. Unfortunately. Yeah, I got to root for Mahomes. You know, Texas Texas Tech loyalty there. Um, air raid offense. Plus, it'd just be cool to to see him pull out some some more magic. But yeah, I hope to see a shootout one way or another. And with that, we'll close. Join us next week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question or just a comment, send an email to podcast at trip.com and subscribe to the Tripwire podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right. <laughs>